right, good evening. Welcome to uh, the next Civil War Digital Digest live stream. And I'll be honest, this one is pretty much the freest form of any that we've had so far. We've had historians, we've had photography, we've had forts. We're going to go ahead and just talk about what we do tonight. And that's we're going to talk about making movies and making historic movies. <clears throat> Folks are starting to check in. Andrew's here from uh, Northern California, who is one of our coffee grinders. I want to start by introducing this evening the two fellas who've agreed to come along on this magic memory ride and talk about what we do. Um, to my left on your screen is Mr. Shane Seeley from Wide Awake Films out in Missouri. And to the right is my friend Brian James Egan from the Henry Ford, amongst many other independent projects here in Michigan. Gents, thanks for coming on this evening. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey. Yeah, thank you, Will. Uh, Shane, Austin Murray's already saying hi to you in the chat already. So we've got folks checking in. Hey, We're, Austin. How are you, man? So, and uh, Neil's checking in from Central Alaska. He's one of our coffee grinders. So, but let's go wow. ahead. Let's start this evening. Yeah, no, Neil's been a great supporter. So many people have. Uh, this week, normally, folks, we talk about everybody uh, about who the new coffee grinders are, uh, because of what's going on in the world right now with COVID, and that we've not had any new coffee grinders signed up. So, if you are somebody thinking about that, I will go ahead and put the link here in the um, chat. But the bottom line is, I hope you guys are having a great time with these things. They're a heck of a lot of fun to do uh, on the off weeks, and they keep me busy during this point in time. Uh, Laura Roscoe says hi. Let's do this. Let's switch over a little bit. We're going to talk tonight about making movies, telling stories with cameras, and these two gents really would, really, I mean, I've grown up running with Brian and learning from him, and Shane's been somebody I've looked up to for quite a number of years, and matter of fact, his company bought a camera that I had just been assigned when I was on Chicago PD, and I sent Shane a Facebook message because the first generation of this camera's eyepiece really stunk, and I said, hey, Shane, we know who each other are. We've both got cameras that have problems. Let's chat. And we had our first ever conversation there. So let's open up with you, Shane. Yeah. Tell us, a, that's the briefest of how we actually started talking. Talk to us a, a little bit about yeah. your background. Um, you know, uh, yeah, God, it started, and I was in uh, third grade, man. That's when I really got into this stuff. I, uh, uh, my dad's first job out of college was in Decatur, Illinois, and uh, we moved there. I had a reading problem. I figured out how to read and I got into Lincoln and he was like my gateway drug into all of the civil war obsession that I've continued for from childhood. And I got into reenacting before I got into uh, filmmaking, but uh, I'll never forget, man, I was, uh, you know, I'd been dressing in civil war clothes as a kid, marching in parades in small Kansas towns and being the only guy. And I looked in the magazine at the grocery store, the rack, and they had muzzle loading magazine in like 1978, <laughs> maybe. And are all these guys wearing the clothes? I'm like, wow, adults do this. And I just kind of got into it from there and, and, and really got into um, the video side of things and uh, making films and really more news, but, uh, but kept my foot reenacting and I call it merging geekdoms. So I'm kind of into the video geek space. I think you guys could probably uh, ascribe to that. I'm, I, I use the same uh, nerdiness that I apply to like picking out a, a Civil War Kepi as I would a camera. And um, and just been fortunate to man just uh, know some really great people in the Civil War community, have some just really great people and crew who, uh, you know, filmmaking is a team sport. And uh, I've been really lucky to have a great team of people around me. And and uh, that's what we do. And I've just been shooting things. And I, I got started in the 90s shooting the 130th event cycles. Um, so uh, with a company called Video Post out of here in Kansas City. And we would go in by rights to the big events and um, and film them and pre-sell a documentary. You guys remember all that stuff probably back in the day. And, um, and that was fun. And uh, it was a great way to see uh, big reenactments back when they were really big. So that's yeah. kind of my story. I'm thinking 135th. I'm thinking Pickett, sitting at Pickett's Charge, uh, my first company command, being on the line and looking at 12,000 Confederates come at yeah. us and realize that there's not a thing that myself or the men under my direct command can do for about the first three quarters of that, but sit back and watch. We just There's nothing we effectively can do. So, and that yeah. was a, that probably one of the smallest times I felt in my life as you talk about learning stories and gaining experiences. Well, Brian, as I turn to you, Shane's not the only one getting people calling out in the uh, in the comments. Chad Johnson just said, Brian Egan in the flesh? Wow, starstruck. 
Hello, Chad. <laughs> so, so uh, Huck Green's checking in probably from Texas these days as he's down there at work. He says, still, he says still have the VHS, but not the VHS player. Huck, I've got a VHS um, player we can take care of you with there. I've, I keep one intentionally for transfers, so... Brian, let's throw it to you. Talk to us a little bit about your world in history and in movies. So, yeah, my background is in history as a, as a profession, as an education, and then filmmaking um, also as well. And kind of like Shane and probably many of you, it started at a very, very early age. My grandmother had given me the old two-volume Bruce Catton pictorial history of the Civil War. Um, and it was the pictorial history, and I remember, you know, I, I pretty much broke the binding on it, just studying it, and, you know, my parents were very supportive, and it said, you know, we're going to go to Gettysburg, and my, I remember my dad taking me aside, and I'm like 11 years old, or, or something, and he goes, you know, Brian, there's not going to be, there's not going to be cannons and dead horses, <laughs> bodies around, so, you know, and I'm like, I, I kind of get it, Dad, but he just wanted me to, because I was so engrossed in it, but... Then, you know, Shane, it's very similar to you. I, I started, um, I rounded up the neighborhood kids, my cousins, my brother. We, uh, we acquired all the blue and gray old sports coats we could. I went to Yex and Dundee, bought brass buttons. We had Civil War reenactments in my Uncle Roy, who was a Civil War reenactor's backyard. And he, uh, you know, back in the day with the video camera, and, you know, I would block out scenes and stuff like that. And we'd try to put it together. And, you know, ever since then, I, you know, have degrees in history. I work at the Henry Ford, um, mostly in the program side of it. But then the last five years, I I started up our internal film department. So it's that symbiotic relationship between filmmaking and history, living history. It's all sort of storytelling. Fantastic. Well, Brian, what they're seeing right now is they're seeing an image from uh, the Antietam documentary. I think we're at the Sunken Road, and we see you and your Uncle Roy dressed there, and the other fellow wearing the second lieutenant straps is Gary Hubb, who's also in the film industry out on the West Coast now. So <laughs> being able to bring, be able to, when you mentioned your Uncle Roy filming for you, here he is marching next to you or working with you on the Antietam documentary some years back. So... Well, for me, I come to filmmaking late. I come to history early. Um, the book Rifles for Weighty caught me as a kid. Uh, the story about a young boy working with Stan, working with a rifle run for Stan Weighty that I'm actually about to go back and reread. Um, I don't know movies very well. I think I'm going to law school, and I have a professor who realizes I have no business being in law school, and he's my mentor I professor. That. And he had done, uh, he had just done voices. I went to James Madison College at Michigan State. And he had uh, went ahead and he told me, he said flat out, he said, I just worked with a documentary company and they're going to do a project on reenactors. Call them. And as I tell people, when your mentor professor says call them and puts a period at the end of the sentence, that's the end of it. So um, I learned to shoot from Brad Graham and Media Magic Productions and Historical Film Group. Brian and I knew who each other were here in Michigan, but we really got to know each other working together on the Antietam documentary. Um, and I've built a visual background, bought a tool from that company called the Steadicam, which has become an addiction in my life and the reason that I drink whiskey in the evening because of my lower back. So um, <laughs> I've picked up working on both, you know, I stay active in the reenacting hobby, but I'm also active like these two fellas in media. I do more away from history than with history these days, though with Civil War Digital Digest, I'm trying to sort of get back to that a lot more. Uh, we did Hold My Horse a couple of years ago, and I'm finally moving like Shane and Brian into the director's chair, and I directed my first short last summer. Now if we just finish it, we need about six more shots, and who'd have thought getting ten people together would have been the stopper for any show anywhere, but with COVID, we're waiting to finish. So, well, you know, Martin Scorsese says you're never done with the film. You just have to walk away from it. Right? Well, I'm, I'm ready to abandon it, but I got some really good feedback that before we abandon it, you're exactly right. So uh, Jim Scheidel's checking in, saying hi to you, Shane. He's also saying hi to Dom Dobella, who's, who's hiding around here. Uh, we've got greetings from the wilderness, from Maryland, from Georgia. So let me ask you this. Hey, let me ask you this, fellas, and whoever wants to pick up first can pick up. <clears throat> What's the importance? 
where does historical accuracy fit in filmmaking to you? I don't think you need it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, um, I think uh, it's where you start. You know, I mean, uh, even if you can't get everything just absolutely right, there's usually a silhouette that you can follow with military um, things. And, you know, Saving Private Ryan, uh, you know, I think we talked about that. That's why that movie works. I mean, they start with history. They start with documentation. Um, and even if someone hasn't studied it avidly, I hadn't when I first saw it. I didn't know World War II uniforms. Uh, I can't even say. I'm not as well as I maybe do, do Civil War. But um, when I watched that movie, it just felt good. I've been. I, you could see there was a lot of thought put into it, and the way they carried the gear. And I don't know. It just. It you know soldiers. Uh, you know if you've reenacted, you've worn that stuff for a long time, and you know kind of how to wear it comfortably. And sometimes actors don't really have that come across but uh you know in this instance you, uh, you know you can tell that they spend a lot of time on it and, and uh, i don't know it's where we start stuff drives me crazy without it i think it's just a good box to work in creatively and um and why not appease the one percent of people that know what they're looking at you know because everyone else is you know and and unfortunately people get their history through what we do and um it's important for us to depict it properly and i've just you know even this year i did Big time show that's on a major cable network. I ended up reenacting was just bad on it. I mean, not the reenacting, but the military mm. scenes were terrible. You know, yeah. it's like, man, someone needs to go find the blue and gray wardrobe van and burn it, and then we would yeah, never see it. Yeah, right. right, right. I, you know what though? Looking at the few shots I saw from that, I think the blue and gray looked better than that stuff. <laughs> well, well, you know, from the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, it really is. It, it's all in the details and. You know, I think as filmmakers and, and tackling historic subjects, I think there's a little bit of a responsibility involved with that, too, that, you know, the vet, like you said, Shane, maybe 1% of the people will know the difference between, you know, a flannel blouse and if it's a war versus, you know, blanket weight, sack coat. Um, and most of us can pick that up that are into it. But, you know, the vast majority of the audience doesn't know. And therefore, it's like I want when I look at it, I want to give them the most appropriate representation or accuracy as possible. And I, I mentioned this to Will and Shane earlier that, you know, with a, a film that I did in the current Sedal Creek Bridge, you know, my colorist who colored the film said, you know, after going through this, it sort of had a merchant ivory feel for it. And I took that as a huge compliment knowing that a lot of people aren't going to necessarily know that I had, you know, 50 and probably some of the, best Union Civil War Western soldiers, but it, it just lends to that look and feel. And like you said, Shane, in, in Private Ryan, you know, they had those soldiers or those actors go through sort of a boot camp to, to carry themselves to, 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 you know, go through the motions and that. And I think it's the material culture. I think it's all, it all adds to the contextualism and the texture and the palette that we work with as, as storytellers. And, sure. Um, well, let me give a shout out to both of you guys from another storyteller. Gary Hubb has checked in. He says, hi to Brian. Great to see you again. And howdy, Shane. Enjoy your work. And if you guys haven't met, I'll facilitate Thanks. introductions sooner than later, Shane. Uh, Ken Irvin says, Skulk, uh, Skulker, shout out to Shane Seeley. That's the unit. Skulker's mess back in the 90s. Yep. Uh, Steve Dacus uh, says, people know the difference in accuracy even if they don't know it. Uh, Steve uh, produces the 11th OVC uh, YouTube series, so glad to have him with oh, yeah. us this evening. Seeing so, stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, so, I, you know, it's totally where it's at. And, you know, working with living historians has a real value, not just for the, not just for the look of it. One of the things we did when we did Hold My Horse, of course, I'm producing, my friend Tim is directing, and he's like, how do we do this? What do we do? I said... Some things we're going to worry about, some things we don't need to worry about. Our friend Jason Reinholtz came in as one of the soldiers, and we slotted him into the first sergeant. We, the captain had uh, that he was with had two lines, and actually st is the stand-in for, uh, for Sergeant Voigt on the show Chicago PD. Great guy, great actor, no background to living history. When he showed up, uh, we put him in a uniform, and I just looked him dead in the eyes, and I said, look, You've got two lines. The director will have the time he'll have. I mean, we're all good friends because we all worked. And I said, this is Jason. He's a first sergeant. He knows what he's doing. You're a junior officer and you don't. Shut the hell up and listen to him. 
and we just let <laughs> a we let a veteran hist history big brother sort of help him around historically, and that was a really great thing in our world. Brian, let me ask you this. You've done something I haven't done, and Shane, jump in. I don't know your total library. I don't know if you've done this. Brian has taken an original work and adapted it for the screen. Mm. Is that something you've done yet, Shane? I haven't. I haven't. I'd love to. I've got I've got an idea in mind, and I'm looking seriously at an adaptation right now. But So I guess being the person who gets to ask the questions here and have it out in the front of everything... Talk to us, Brian, about taking a story like Ambrose Bierce's Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge and taking not only Civil War history, but a famous story and turning it into a movie. And there, what, where the weights are, where the fun is, where the challenges are. Well, you know, as my first film, I wanted to be sort of the calling card project and I wanted to be somewhat small, short story, but yet I, I tackled a subject and a story that isn't anything but that. And I think many of us, I know in high school, I saw the original black and white version that won, I think, an Academy Award. And um, even though that the material culture and that, and I think it was produced in France, I mean, it was abysmal and, you know, the living man song. But still, it, it, you know, it sort of inspired me. And, you know, I've always said I wanted to do the color version of that. And so, you know, the challenge is, if you know the story, all, all of it is very cerebral in the, in, in the mind of one individual, Peyton Farquhar, the, the, the protagonist or antagonist, however you want to look at it. Um, and Ambrose Spears never answers that question for you, so you're left to it by yourself. And the whole story takes place within, in real time, the maybe two seconds from when a man drops off of a plank till the end of a rope where it hangs and, and, and breaks his neck. And so everything else is just, you know, his life flashed before him. And some of the story that Ambrose Spears described in it, 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 there was no other way to do it other than create dialogue. And I remember reading over and over that story again. And when I tried to re or write a script for some of the dialogue scenes, I, I, I was proud of myself that I had gotten into that mindset of Ambrose Pierce, not that I would ever be Ambrose Pierce level, but I was able to, to recreate the dialogue. Or That's create, pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, it's like when you read Civil War yeah. letters, you know, the original yeah. manuscripts, it's like at first it takes you a little bit and you can't read Then, you know, by after your five or six of them, you're reading them and then you start talking that way. I mean, I have a good friend, Jack Dempsey's co-author of the Michigan book we wrote and him and you know, our emails are all your sir. I've received favorably, you know, it's all like that. But anyway, and in, 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 in so recreating those those dialogues to pick up the parts that Ambrose Spears just wrote sort of as a narrative to sort of bridge the visual parts together. And I remember Rich Brower, you know, Rich mm -hmm. will. Sure. And I had many discussions. It's like, you know, in the original story, when Peyton comes up to the gate, the gate opens by itself or do we have Peyton do it? I mean, so we were comparing the original story to what Ambrose, I mean, because a lot of times Rich was saying, well, Brian, you know, the original story did this. I'm like, Rich, that's not how Ambrose Pierce wrote it. You know what I'm saying? So there was the challenge, but also fun in doing that. And uh, I, I probably should, should let you go to the next question, but there, there were a lot of challenges and, um, and, uh, uh, fun times, like you said, too, and just trying to, to really get that. And again, I wanted to make sure that we had an accurate set. We had accurate, uh, you know, soldiers. I wanted the material culture of the, the female scenes with Peyton's wife. Um, even had the, the children, you know, in a jean cloth uh, a jacket, a half scale cannon. You know, we went for the full sort of details of that yep. and tried to spare no expense to that. So no, it was a lot of fun. Shane, I'm going to toss it over to you. I've seen a number of your pieces, and the one I'm most mm -hmm. taken with is the George Caleb Bingham uh, documentary done oh. recently. So it's a newer piece. Uh, talk a little bit about it to everybody, and also talk to us about where we can see it, because I've been sharing it out as much as I can. Hey, thank you. No, we appreciate it. You can, yeah, uh, it's called The American Artist, um, The Life and Times of George Caleb Bingham. And if you don't know Bingham, Bingham was uh, an artist from Missouri who painted the river life um, in the 1840s and 50s. And um, he's got a painting at the Met that they claim uh, back in the day when they had the, the old guys counting people coming into the Met to look at painting. 
they would say that painting is a masterpiece and um, it's one of the top 10 paintings that the fire breaks out that we yank out of here. And so, but a lot, a lot of people, you know, really knew about him uh, at, at the end of the war. He, he painted some, he painted a painting called Order Number 11 that a lot of reenactors know about. And there was a lot of controversy around it and it kind of helps, you know, it, it helped kind of end his career in some respects. Um, but yeah, we just were approached by uh, the Friends of Arrow Rock, which is the the place where Arrow Rock, Missouri, which used to be a river town here in Missouri, um, about three hours from where I'm at now, and uh, uh, and they wanted a film done, and we were able to kind of put something together um, budget-wise. We had a big funder, and we got that put on uh, regional PBS and played all over the country in that respect, and, and it was a lot of fun. It was like finally not making, hey, I don't need what? I don't need a smoke machine. I, I don't need to do squibs. I'm not <laughs> chilling anyone. So um, we did do the burning of Lawrence in small capacity, but for the most part, we were we were recreating, you know, this guy who uh, kind of taught himself how to paint in the frontier, you know, where Daniel Boone was living, and and it was a lot of fun, and uh, it was it was just definitely a different project uh, for us, and uh, ended up winning a regional Emmy, and um, uh, and it has kind of led into other stuff uh, for us, but uh, you know, it's just but it all goes back to. What I learned, you know, in the Civil War space and what I've learned from all these great friends and people in the community, you know, and that, that we have, I'm, uh, you know, an amateur historian, but all the people that are professional historians, I've learned a lot from them, too. And we just take the same techniques that we all apply to our films and, and put it on that that piece of subject and make sure things look right and make sure things are done properly. And um, and it really, you know, I think helps uh, provide a mojo and a vibe that ends up in the finished piece. You know, I really do. And um, so uh, it's been that was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, um, I learned a lot. And I just I just shot something for the about the Missouri River for Nat Geo the last three days. So there's something else coming out about that. And uh, good. Um, you know, yeah, the rivers uh, have some great stories to tell. That's for sure. It's, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. You say an amateur historian. The way I refer to, the way I talk to people now is we talk more about what we're doing with Civil War Digital Digest and some of the other projects and say, look, there are public historians, there are academic historians, folks like Brian in the public space doing mm -hmm. stuff like that. I say what I do is not history. I'm not a historian. I do historical right. support. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> say, uh, you know, we everything we do, I mean, if you want to come check our script out it's usually footnoted but, um, so, uh, you know, but uh, i love we're it nerds. we're nerds about it but uh, uh but still i mean um you know, we didn't get a PhD in history. So. Nah, but I've got to say, I appreciate you introducing me to Bingham because one of his paintings is the, in the Detroit Institute of Arts here. Yeah. And it's one of the, and I, I know I sent you the picture, Shane, going, my God, look what I found when my wife and I were down there for our wedding anniversary trip away from having daughters for a little bit, uh, a way to be a right. couple on, on anniversary. Because I've been looking for a long time for images on the inside of a tavern or pub from the mid 19th mm. century, and they're just almost impossible. So, matter of fact, Saturday morning we will start construction in my garage on a mobile set for the sample room, the coffee room, or the coffee oh, grinders. Wow. Our patrons yeah. have been seeing a few mixed drink episodes that we keep over on Patreon to make sure that the Digest channel has as good a content for teachers. So we figured putting alcohol there, maybe not the best yeah. thing, but we're doing mixed drink recipes in a period setting with a period recipe book for the patrons. And we're going to build a set and that Bingham That's picture cool. is our motivation for it and our design piece. Wonderful. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. What's interesting is... Uh, you know, that piece, I had a co-director, Keith Johnson, he's our creative director, and he well, he and I direct a lot of stuff together, and he got so inspired by that that he taught himself how to literally paint and starts doing portraits, and that's oh. what he does. I mean, he's a pretty wow. pretty interesting guy, but it was really inspiring for him to uh, to kind of go that route, and yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's interesting how these projects impact people, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, all around us, and that's what's great about, you know, uh, retelling, being able to retell these stories. Uh, mm -hmm. and TJ Casey, who's a regular around here, said, I would never have heard about Bingham if it weren't for y'all talking about him right now. Stories. Good. It's, sometimes yeah. it's a documentary. Sometimes it's just a great story. I mean, Shane, you said, hey, we don't need squibs. We don't need smoke. We needed smoke, but yeah. when we did Hold My Horse, we intentionally started doing narratives with 
a day in the life wanted to show that civil war wasn't always combat and yeah. so we took a story that was a moral lesson uh with uh, uh with israel richardson and christian stolte from the sister cast now my main cast chicago fire was kind enough to come in and play him especially because we were on chicago pd at the time and his daughter is part of the camera crew there she took one look at the script tim and i were working on she looked at she read it she came back and she just flat announced to us let me have this copy dad's gonna do it and That's so, cool. So we've got to say yeah. a very big thanks to Corinne and to Christian for coming in. And between, it's interesting. The one thing I really learned there on that project is we had a nice little drama written. It was a real lesson in casting because when you cast two of the best comedic actors I know, Stolte and Patrick Webb, you can write straight stuff, and it's it's like the good comedy when you talk when you listen to people talk about the good of Star Wars, how Star Wars was funny because it wasn't written with one-liners; it was what the uh, it was what the cast brought to the dialogue. We walked away. We went in to shoot a drama, and we walked away with a little ironic comedy with a moral in it. Right. So, uh, Shane, talk to me a little bit about some of the other projects you've done. Or, talk, you know what, let's skip it. Let's go this way. Folks aren't asking a ton of questions, but they're loving what's going on here. Uh, I hand you a budget. And obviously, yeah. the three of us know that handing you a budget's a wide, broad thing. But I hand you a budget. What's a story mm -hmm. out of the Civil War era that you want to tell? Well, I, if I were to... If I were to Give my hand, Shane may go do it before me, or you might well. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Hey, you know, the one I tell, if somebody can do it right, I'm all for it. Let's finally show what Civil War combat really looked like. No one's done it. Let's show the, the true tenacity, the true courage that it takes to march into a cannon, and the amount of lead flying, the macabre nature of... It has well, to have been... No one's done it. I mean, right. I've seen it in Walking Dead and stuff, but I haven't seen it really done, uh, you know, in this space. So, well, that to me, that that's a that's a that'd be cool to show people, and um, they need to know. And I think they'd have a little more respect for things, have a little more respect for those monuments, have a little more respect for things when they uh, when they saw them. So, right. just to know the courage that it took. And I'm not saying other wars that weren't just as bad, but man, you know, the, it was a very, very unforgiving weapon system that these guys walked into, um, to the human body anyway. And, um, you know, they were well, and, and, and to that point too, as much as, you know, Lincoln, the, the Spielberg film was great when I heard Lincoln was doing it. I was excited that some of the same private Ryan aspects were going to be employed. And I don't think they were, but you know, Shane, I agree with you totally not to, not to be the macabre, but you read accounts of some of the supporting lines during even Pickett's charge. And when the canister rounds are going through where knapsack parts, body parts and stuff are, are, are just flying through that, you know, you don't necessarily see that and no offense because we've all done, you know, reenactor films or, you know, and the yeah. ATM documentary we did, you know, yeah. we really worked hard on some material culture things, and I think that's some really good combat, but it, it, it wasn't destined for exactly what you're saying. It, yeah. It'd be tough to do. I think it'd be, you could do it now, but, and you kind of ask yourself why, and, you know, we did a, the, uh, the imperfect film that plays at Wilson's Creek, and I did a lot of research on a lot of the Kansas units, and I came across a piece of research that was interesting, and we put it in our documentary, August Light, which we did on the Battle of Wilson's Creek in Missouri. But it was, like, written in, I think, 1895. It was a newspaper account from Topeka reminding people of who ran at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, what yeah. members of the co different companies ran and shirked their duty. Here it is in the 1890s or whatever it was. I mean, it was like and, they're, and, they're, they're, and they're naming names. Oh, yeah, definitely. Wow. Name and names and everything. So you kind of get a sense of the peer pressure the guys were facing, too. You know, it's like you're on the local high school football team and you got to, you know, go in for the gifford. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and Will, to. I'm sorry. I was gonna say, let me pull this back, Brian. I'll turn it to you in just a second. Let me let me pull back no, into sorry. the let me pull back into the comments here. Austin Murray did say, Shane, when are we gonna get Speedy and myself to blow up some stuff for you and your guys? And then he said, Shane, we got you. So I think he's liking what you're talking there. Uh, Dom Dobello said, good answer, Shane. Uh, Blaine Karen uh, said, I want the soldiers' perspective, both sides from start to finish. The Civil War band of brothers. 
interesting interesting to use that term we've had that um i've got a question did the 1861 series boys of 61 remember that you guys ever see that it was on just barely in like the 80s but anyway kind of what blaine's talking about yeah so before i ask shane's question brian you were going to jump in there project a civil war story you'd like to tell you know, I, I think the, the dynamic of Alan Pinkerton and his involvement and, and, and the whole thing with Lincoln, um, you know, at the Henry Ford, where I work, we have the Lincoln assassination chair and, you know, uh, the 150th of that, we had done some pretty deep dives and dispelled some myths about, oh, there's blood on the chair. And it's like, well, it's really oil from, you know, hair and stuff like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, in looking at that topic, the Pinkerton, you know, you could start with the McClellan, you know, I mean, the famous photograph, he's right there, and McClellan is like, mm-hmm. is McClellan really that poor of a, you know, judgment, or is it like he's getting, you know, but that's that's a topic for another discussion, but I think that dynamic and the, the aspect of, of the involvement with Lincoln and just, I think that's a fascinating story, and as a little aside, I David McCullough, who wrote a book on the Wright brothers, you may know, um, actually came to the Henry Ford. And I had an opportunity to sit down and have lunch with him. And I asked him what other books he's working on and stories. And he said he doesn't really know. He said he usually just talks to people and conversations like this. And he asked me, is there somebody from from U.S. history that I thought would be a fascinating article or book? I said, yeah, Alan Pinkerton. So I told my boss that if uh, he comes out with a book on Alan Pinkerton, I want to raise. But, um, you know, I mean, it's just it's all about the story and, and the and and the in Shane and I and you were talking about this. It's sort of the triumph of the human spirit in a way in the face of like walking and, you know, you know, the the guys that went up against the New York light artillery, and the t- you know, double canister at 10 rounds. It's like mm-hmm. there's a moral question with that because, you know, is suicide, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. that was suicide. They knew it. Yep. And yet they were doing it, you know, yep. and, and some faiths and beliefs. It's like you're you're to damnation for that. But yet they did it. And it's like, yeah, there, there's a fortitude there or it's and as much as it's been blown out of whatever. But. I remember the ROTC group went to Gettysburg and we were out on the first day's fight. And, you know, I relayed the story about Bayard Wilkerson. And again, I know some of it's been sensationalized, but it's like, mm-hmm. I looked at every one of them, 18, 19 years old. And I'm like, this kid is 19 years old, you know, and he's on the horse until he, you know, what 19 year old kid, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, that's, that's the type of stories throughout history. I think that really need to be told. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got uh, John Pillars here told us to mind our eye. So <laughs> so more people saying Company H. Um, so tons of ideas coming out here. Uh, TJ Case says, well, I mean, McClellan's experiences as an observer in Crimea influenced him, but I digress, which is interesting because actually my thing in collecting is actually original text. And about three years ago, I was able to get an original copy of McClellan's report to the Secretary of War that was sent to the Senate. So I've got some of the original wood, some of the original drawings that are the shelter tent that we will see in the Civil War that are McClell- the McClellan saddle, which was French. And so that was really fascinating. Uh, Jim Scheidel says he thinks the Pinkerton film will garner rave reviews. Um, if you have a little known story with, okay, uh, Danny, we'll hit you with that later and share amongst ourselves. Da- Danny Younger says, if we have a little known story with blockbuster potential, how may we reach you? Uh, any of us can be found. Let's do this right now uh, because this is a chance to give shout outs because I don't have them linked. Shane, would you talk about your website and how we can see some of your work in uh, Wide Awake? Yeah, yeah. You can just go to wideawakefilms.com, see a lot of our stuff. We've got a YouTube channel as well. Um, you know, we build our company, uh, you know, we're a big uh, commercial production company. We, we do a lot of post work, um, a lot of work, 12 of us. Um, so uh, we build a lot of high volume content for a lot of entities, but the one I'm pr- most proud of is we do work for the American Battlefields Trust and uh, Battlefield Trust. I keep wanting to add an S to that. Um, and uh, so you can go to their site at civilwar.org and um, 
uh, see uh, a lot of the stuff that we've done. We just did a, uh, a BR film for them that uh, was released last October, a kind of Civil War 1864 that um, has garnered over a million views since October, since it went up, and um, it's gotten some, some pretty good traction. And we shot all that here with uh, a lot of Holmes Gay guys, a lot of great reenactors that uh, we have in the Kansas City area, and um, a lot of good young reenactors. A lot of uh, you guys will know, like Cameron Arm and Garrett Lips. Those are Kansas City transmits yep. guys. And, uh, you know, and uh, which, you know, it's interesting. You know, it's, I know there's a lot of East Coast reenactors, but there's a lot of good guys out here too. And um, we were able to, uh, you know, they come out and help us out a bunch. So, but those are good places to see our stuff. And um, so, that's, sure, that's where you can catch it. Brian, you want to talk a little bit about how we see some of your stuff these days? Sure. Well, the last four or five years, uh, it's mostly been through the Henry Ford. Um, and so we have a, a, a YouTube channel and my my team's responsible for our internal videos that we do there. And so they're, they're the three to four minute, um, you know, snippets, a wide, a wide swath of American history um, that you can see there. I would also say, too, a project that we did or that I was involved with recently is the River Raisin Legacy Project, and you can just Google that and see it as well. Cool. And I, I don't have the sort of pedigree of, no. of, of stuff that, uh, like, Shane does. But. Well, well I haven't done a narrative film like you have either, so I've always done just docs and stuff that work for hire and documentaries, so I've never right. really – the Civil War film's the first time I really got into it, so it's good. So I'm, um, we want to do more. But, I'm, I'm, yeah. loving, I'm loving doing narrative and I'm loving where we find, where we can find an intersection, where we can tell a story. Because one of the things I've been saying to folks is, look, the number one grossing movie of all times is a period film. You know, well, it's Titanic. I, it's, a, it's a period film. And the number two grossing movie of all times, which I believe is still gone with the wind because it was leading mm -hmm. until, until Titanic, is a period film. Hmm. People and if you, enjoy yeah. getting away. So I, re, I really enjoy using history as a way for people to have a chance to see something, experience something, and get away for a little bit. The end, the entertainment yeah. and the relaxation. Go ahead, and Brian. Will, to your, no, to your point, Will, I, if you do a tally of the Academy Award-winning films over the years, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it's over half our period films. And even the ones that were up, you know, that didn't win in those years, that were not period films, there were many period films in the running. So absolutely. I, I think I think it's, you know, people, I always look at it this way. If I can make somebody cry, have goosebumps, or, or move them to a firmament, then I've done my job as a filmmaker. And, you know, I think it's, you know, I want to touch that secret place of awe in everybody, you know, to, sure. to sort of, and I think that's what we all want to do. If, if you can watch a, a film and it's just like, whatever, you don't think about it. But Shane and I were talking before this. It's like, if you can come in and, and a film and you wake up the next morning and you're thinking about that experience and it yep. sort of transforms your life in some way, or at least gets you thinking, I think then you've done your job. I mean, yep. I mean it can be entertainment, of course, but sure. I, I think that there's that other, I won't say responsibility, but I think there's that other aspect to, to storytelling and filmmaking that, it's a powerful thing. Yeah. You know, I, I think that everybody, the way we approach everything, the way I approach my craft is everybody's an expert in this stuff. We've all been looking at stuff since we were born. And if your stuff isn't as engaging as anything else they're seeing out there, then you're going to lose them. And, you know, and uh, I don't know, that's just what we try to do. We really try to kind of like reset every time we do stuff and, and push ourselves and how can we be better? And yep. especially with this stuff, they're competing with a lot out there, especially in the gaming world. I mean, it's hard to get that same experience that they can from Call of Duty, you know, Pacific Theater, you know, I mean, sure. Or Marvel know, films, Shane, mm -hmm. you know, superhero <laughs> films. It's like, you can't, you know, let me ask you guys this. Uh, Andy Roscoe checked in uh, and he said, who has been, who's been on with us regularly here, and he asked, do you prefer to tell Civil War history in film and, uh, on film in narrative or documentary format and why? Go ahead, Brian. That is a great <laughs> question. And I would say yes <laughs> to both. Um, I've done a lot of documentary work, mostly behind the camera. Uh, I will, as you know, as I did a, a ton of AD work, 
mm-hmm. with a lot of the Park Service films. Yep. And I love the documentary as uh, film work, but I also love the narrative too, where you can really delve deep into characters. I don't say characters, but the story, and it, and you can do that in documentaries too with vignettes, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's sometimes when you have historians and subject matter experts that can help bridge the gaps. Um, but history is so rich with drama with, I mean, like quote Hollywood appeal that why do you need to really stray from, from the truth in that? And I guess I love both aspects of it. And for me, I just, I just love the storytelling aspects of it. And if I could be on set working every day in my life, I would be happy, you know. Yeah, you'd be single. Your wife would leave you, and she'd probably blame well, me. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> well, will I mean, Jody will tell you after a long week or two of filming, and I don't know if you guys experienced this. I got yeah. out of bed one night, and, you know, directing a scene, and, and Jody's like, "Brian, what are you doing?" It's like, go back to bed, you know, Brian. <laughs> yeah, you yep. don't want to order food at the end of the day because your mind is just like, yeah. just like. Well, I, I didn't share my one story that I'd like to see told in the Civil War, and it sort of gets to where both of you guys are talking there. I'd like to see the street fight from Fredericksburg. Not the charges up the hill, not the stuff in the woods. I'd yeah. like to see the fight through town done as a film. That'd be cool. Following either the 7th Michigan or the 20th Massachusetts, counterparting it with a Confederate sharpshooter trying to first hold off and then get out of the house and survive safely. There's a wonderful account in a book that um, John Hennessy had published through the Historical Society there of a lady who was trapped in the um, basement of her house because her 10 or 11 year old child was sick and having two daughters between eight and 10 right now, I just feel for her the inability to get out until late in the day. And Mm. all of these stories juxtaposed. Burnside's stupidity up the hill doesn't hold much for me. But what happened in that town, maybe from the time bridging the, uh, maybe from the time rowing across the river in pontoon boats to make it so the fellows could get through to the time where the fight started, what it took to secure the town, I'd love to see done as a narrative piece. I think that's a great idea. Americans are so used to seeing that in Europe or in the mm-hmm. Middle East or wherever. Or in World War II. So for them to witness that, or yeah, but but never here in an American city, I think it'd be great. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think, too, Will, to, to, what, to, to tag on to what you're saying, and, you know, not to, uh, yeah, I would love to see the military combat, but I think, you know, the human interest aspects to a lot of these, and that's where something like you're talking about, you know, because people are like, oh, Brian's a Civil War nut. And it's like, well, you know, who shot who, when and where? I've studied that and tactics and, you know, I find it interesting. But what really gets to me is, is the human interest stories mm-hmm. of it. Right. Yep. You know, right. I mean, even if it was the combat, you know, where the guys are going up to the wall on the third day in Pettigrew's division and he says, come on to this side of the Lord and captures the Confederate and pulls them. I mean, you know, it's stuff like that. That's, mm-hmm. you know, you can't. You can't fictionalize that. It's, well, it's the truth. Huck Green re- reached out with his idea. He he said, "Here's one: the wide awakes, the movement." And I would just say, <laughs> I would just say, Huck, finish your beer, hang on a couple of weeks, and hang on a couple of months, and just chill out. There, we'll have something to say to you at some point down the road here. Mm-hmm. Um, Shane, I've, I've got a picture. I got to throw the question to you, and then Shane Pinson has a question for all of us. But Shane, documentary or narrative? Um, you know, I'm still staying in the documentary space because uh, that seems to be the projects and opportunities that we have. Um, I think the format's fun. I like it. And uh, I like kind of the, the whole multimedia aspects of it. But, um, you know, we're starting to look at how we can develop some narrative stuff, too. And, um, and it's definitely a little more daunting. You know, um, we're kind of picky about story craft and stuff. And um, uh, but, um, the, you know, we, we just actually put together a, a, a offline version of all our narrative stuff that we have done. And I'm like, eh, it's not too bad, you know, so, uh, it's a lot of fun. You can move through scenes a lot faster and cut them together a little faster yeah. than you can, um, a documentary where you got to mm-hmm. kind of change a shot every three seconds to keep one attention span there. So that's interesting. Um, so I would have to say probably narrative. I'd like to kind of break off and, and you know, keep doing more of that and mm-hmm. look for those opportunities. So, um, but uh, what to do? Hmm. 
don't know. Yeah, yeah well, T- TJ Casey TJ Casey suggests that we do the Pioneer Brigade at Murfreesboro would be interesting. I love Pioneer stuff. And Neil, yeah, Neil, stuff. yeah, Neil Weatherington said seeing actual Civil War surgery. I think Neil's got a twisted sense on reality up there in Alaska. Uh, well, you know, another thing too are those engineers that built bridges in the like Civil War botched, right? Yeah. Civil War botched, yeah, exactly. But those engineers that built those those trussle bridges, you know, General Sherman oh, carries. Yeah. Yep. Tunnels on railroad bridges in his army. It's like, are you, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, Shane Pinson did ask us, what is, let me see, let me get back to the question to make sure I ask it right. And for everybody who's here, we'll be showing this, uh, we'll be replaying this over on the YouTube channel. So I'm making sure I get the question right so folks know it later on when they don't have this list. Shane asked, what is the hardest issue in doing a historical film? Budget. <laughs> most of the time um absolutely I, mean, I think yep definitely a challenge um, because you know and actors we're over the they, they need to get paid and yep. they need to be taken care of and, mm-hmm. and these guys show up with thousands of dollars of stuff that's there i got thousands of dollars of stuff too and usually it's all scattered on <laughs> exactly <laughs> How many things have you lost, Shane, over the years? A lot, but it's okay. But I also, because my stuff's out there, I I have respect for, you know, guys are bringing stuff that they're really sentimentally attached to. And, and skills. And, they've got and skills. Knowledge. Yeah. And the knowledge you get on set. I mean, just, you know, it's just, I'm, I, 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 there's always like, I'm definitely not the smartest reenactor guy on set, you know, um, but it's great to have all these, you know, that, so. That's my thing. I think it's just making sure that uh, they're taken care of, treated nicely, and it should be a good time, man. We yep. our industry gets a, a bad rap because people go out there and they get all stressed out. It's usually crews who don't know history at all who are getting yep. so stressed out about it. <gasps> yeah, well, it's not as hard. We've all been around it, but it should be a good time, man. We should. It's, we're fortunate to be able to do that. I'm grateful to be able to do that. And it should be a good experience for everybody. And it shows up in the finished product. So, you know, um, I don't know if I'm asking, answering the question properly, but, I, you know, that's a oh. big thing for me. And um, we'll always, you know, everybody's uh, everybody's equal on our set. So nobody's, yep. uh, nobody's king of nothing. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, I, I would say, you know, budget obviously is, is a big yeah. consideration. Yeah. And I know with Owl Creek, we, my producer, my co-producer and I, you know, I said, I don't want to move forward unless I can pay these guys, you know, a hundred dollars a day at minimum, put them up in a hotel, you know, um, you know, two beds and there were four guys in a room, which is even better than a 64 shelter tent, right. With spooning, um, and pay and, and feed them. And I remember, you know, our craft guy was carrying around trays of hors d'oeuvres and it didn't matter if they were the, the cast or the reenactors and they were blown away and part of it is that respect to that and yep. you know there's that obligation I think again too you know and that trust level but um, I think the other hard ask or the hard one of the hard things about making a period film is or anybody making period film is just to look at sort of the material culture and sort of the history and try to get it right. And it's a shame when you see things like a recent documentary that was just out that we're not going to mention, but you know, you have to, you have to put people in period clothing. You have to, you know, you do these things and just, just get the right people involved. And it's like, I, I feel like saying, you know, call me. Not because I know everything, because I don't, but I know the right people to call. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I know I know the people and the John Paganos and the, and, and the different people in the community that that we all know that that know. Yep. And but but don't you want to vet that person first before you send them on? <laughs> so well who are you? What do you want to do? And, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I joke okay. like you know you know in these ones when it's a stunt man because they're not wearing their cap or their hat yeah. in any type of, you know, stylish way. Right. Their blouse right. is open and they're wearing a red bandana. It's like, you know, Audie Murphy red badge. You know, you know what? what? And it's Brian, like, I'll I'll break in there. My I didn't know until halfway through college film was the thing for me. And this was the thing for me. My first time ever on a set is on killer angels. 
on what will become Gettysburg. And we're doing the Pickett's Charge Week and we're marching along and right next to our company, I'm the first sergeant of the company, and right next to our company is an opening for three stunt guys with a uh, air mortar and a, and a lifter for the guy. And he comes up and he's wearing his entire belt upside down. I look at him and said, I'm sorry, your belt's upside down. And he looks at me and says, well, I know you guys are all into accuracy and interest in this. This doesn't matter. I look at him and I said, okay, idiot. You've got a pointed finial, not a rounded one. That's pointed at your chest. When you hit the ground, that is going to stab you in the chest. Do you want to turn it over now? <clears throat> I, As I look back, I didn't believe I had the presence of mind as an 18-year-old kid to say that to a stuntman, but he became very thankful very quickly and adjusted his equipment to make himself safe. <laughs> so, yeah, certainly there. Uh, Rob Basich, and Rob, I'm sorry if I'm missing pronunciation in your last name, says, would love to see a narrative of riding quietly with Mosby through enemy lines, ra raiding camps and trains, hiding in houses, climbing out windows, avoiding patrols. What could be better? Hmm. It actually takes us to the next question here, which if we could become the elephant in the room or could be a good discussion point, Dan Hadley said, what's the future of Civil War storytelling mm. in light of the cultural oh, upheaval yeah. we're currently going through? They seem to play together well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brad, go ahead on. This is a good one. Um, that's a tough one. It, it is very tough. And, you know, we're in an era where John Brown monuments and Frederick Douglass monuments are being torn down. And Hans Christian Hegg monuments. And, and yeah, you guys did an episode on that. And yep. And there was a reason that that got done in three weeks and I didn't sleep for three weeks so we could make sure that that came out timely to be, right. a, po yeah. to be a positive response to let people, you know, to the documentary world, to let people learn who Hans Hegg actually is. Right. Well, I think... He's a wide awake. Yeah, Sorry, he, 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 he not only was a wide awake, he was the captain of the chapter. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that's a really, really good question. I think it's a tough question, too. And... You know, I wish I had a crystal ball to figure that out. Um, it is very, um, you know, after I wasn't around for the American centennial of the Civil War, but, you know, some people I know said that after the centennial years, um, there was sort of this fatigue of Civil War history. And I noticed after the 150th, it seemed like there was a little bit of a decline in, in civil war. I remember interest. that. I remember that after the 125th as well, which is really where I get into the hobby is near the yep. end of the 125s. And, you know, I think we're sort of on that, that decline. And then with all of this sort of coming in and, you know, it, it pretty much is the death knell for the time being. But, you know, the one thing that I keep reminding people who bring this up and I work at an institution where I hope nobody's listening, but you know, military history. And even though we have like the Lincoln chair and we have a robust collection of, of items, you know, that that's really not the focus, which is fine. You know, not everything can be the focus, but you know, we have a civil remembrance program and it's one that some of our upper management don't care for. They want to get rid of it because it's not innovative or whatever. And I'm like, you know, you need to stop and think right now, Everything that's going on, and not that just the racial stuff, but how relevant is it? I mean, these yep. questions and these topics, they're years before the Civil War. It's its its a beautiful thing in a way. It's like, look, at we're still arguing over states' rights versus the national, you know, uh, national government. And mm -hmm. those are things that were antebellum years right from the day one. Yep. And in a way, it's... It is hard to probably get into that, but yet look at how relevant it is. I'm not you know, sure. Look at, I'm, I'm guess sorry. I guess, no, no, you're good. But I just say, I think the thing is, is I don't think it's hard to get into. And I think the stories that the three of us tell will continue to resonate because we continue to look for true stories that are good stories about the American condition. The bottom line is the discussion today, to my mind, that we really need to pay attention to is that there are so many stories that have not been told. Yeah. I think it's, a, I think it's an incredibly rich time to be able to mm -hmm. be talk I about did. Civil War history because we've got a Absolutely. lot of stories that are... I mean, the short film I did last year that we're trying to finish up is called Whitney's Metal. It's about William Whitney from the 11th Michigan. 
it's a Medal of Honor story. You start to look, and there's a great <clears throat> book on the Medal of Honor uh, called Deeds of Valor that was printed in 1905 interviewing the folks. There are four pages of stories that aren't even in there. There are members of regiments from all across the Army, from the United States colored troops, from infantry, from cavalry, from artillery. There are so many good stories to tell. We've only told Harriet Tubman's story as a major motion picture any time recently. Yeah, and you know, bringing in all the voices is is and the telling stories is good. I live in Monroe, and we have a um, a larger than life equestrian statue of George Custer. So all of our local protest of everything going on is around that, and. You know, it's a it's a statue of him at Gettysburg called Sighting the Enemy when he's about to go and, you know, kick Jeb Stewart's ass. I'm sorry, the little hometown with the Michigan Cavalry <laughs> Brigade. But, um, you know, and there's there's people protesting that. And I understand the Custer story out west, the Indian situation. It's, it's very dynamic. But, you know, they're like, well, we need to have all the stories told mm -hmm. and all the voices. And I'm like, yeah. And you want to bring in a Confederate story down on the corner of Elm and Monroe Street? People won't want to do that, but no. that's part of the story. Yeah. And so I, I think it's 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 a hot button, and I think it's it's touchy. But I think you like you said, it's so relevant and it's so mm -hmm. important, and uh, it goes back to that sort of I feel like in a way as an obligation, you know, mm -hmm. as filmmakers to tell those stories. Yeah. Right. Andy Roscoe asked a question, and we're getting close to an hour here, and I don't want to keep fellas too long. But let me ask this one, because this one's pretty fun. Uh, and he says, do you think the Civil War being the first American war to be widely photographed makes life easier or more difficult as, civil, let's say, as filmmakers? And Shane, I'm going to throw this mm -hmm. to you first, because you've done a magnificent project with Mount Vernon, your 4D project. So you've worked in the sphere before photography, and you've worked in the photography sphere can you talk about right. that? Sort of to frame Andy's question, can you talk about the yeah, difference yeah, yeah. between those two? Uh, well, yeah. So with Civil War, the photography got me into it. To me, you know, that's what I got hooked on was the photography. And just I can go pull out books that I had in third grade still in my library that are just nothing but photo books. They're so much great stuff that I just sort of stared at and stared at and stared at. But then they're like, hey, do a Revolutionary War project. And I'm like, subject matter expert, uh, where's the reenactor co coordinator? Because that's a whole new world. And You're looking at oil paintings then. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have any reference. And, you know, and I feel like I'm on my fourth, we're on our fourth or fifth Rev War project. So I'm getting better, but I still rely on, like, Brian Stefanik, Wade uh, Rogers, you know. There's some guys that, that come help out, you know, Pagano's helped. Uh, yeah. So, you know, having those guys out, guys like Nate, Nate Hoffman, uh, Tyler Greco, you know, those guys coming out who really are some of the scratch golfers of Rev War to come out and help out, help us, you know, do this stuff. So uh, I've been fortunate there. But, you know, the Civil War, the photography, I think, is useful. I, I really do. I, I wish more um, Hollywood crews would look at it before they, you know, because there's really just a silhouette that you have to follow. You don't yeah. get like, you yeah. know, you yep. don't need the Starbucks keppy, but, uh, you know. Okay, you know, now you're uh, showing off, Shane. I want one of those. <laughs> the one. Uh, you know, you said there's three. Give me a break. <laughs> So uh, John Wickett uh, says the war is a gate. The war, uh, the civil war, is the gateway drug to American history around the world. Personal stories are the gateway drug to any history. Keep it going, gents. No, that's that's a great comment. You know, and about the photos too, it's good and bad because you know, as uh, we look at those photos as historical assets, and one of my pet peeves, and again, it's like, well, most people won't know. The audiences won't know. But it, I look at it back to is, yeah, you have an obligation to tell the right story. And we've all seen even some of the best poetic narrative documentary films that are, you know, five days long or whatever. They're talking about the Battle of Shiloh and they're showing photographs of the dead at Antietam. And it just it just really sort of, you know, it's like nails on a chalkboard. For it me. is. Yeah. It is. And it's and not it's, because I'm a purist or an elitist, yeah. but it's like, look. What, what, what was there, 82 or 83 photographs that Gardner took at Antietam? There's 82 right. or 83, right? It's, and if you're using them to show in the Western theater, it's just, 
I just feel like there's something wrong with that. It's like petting a dog the wrong way or, you know, when you put a shirt on backwards yeah. and you can just. just yeah. Just, well, and I can say I'll I'll say that, and I'll fess up here. So those of you who haven't seen the Hans Hegg biography that we did last week, go watch it because here's your Easter egg. They talk about Hegg getting a ch- an important assignment at the head of the Chickamauga campaign, riding pontoon boats across the river to go ahead and free up to let the engineers be able to lay the pontoon. It smells a lot like Fredericksburg. I dug and dug and dug and dug and dug. I did not have time to shoot recreations because we did this documentary in three weeks. I had to pull a shot for. I had to pull a drawing from Fredericksburg. The fact, if you look quick, it's about four Will, seconds. Will, but yes, okay. but I'm sure that you you treat it in a way. To, we're coming to your house, man. Okay, yeah, I'll buy the beer. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Will, I'm sure. But you know, in those techniques, sure, and you can do a move in or a crop or yep. something that's a little bit different. But you're not necessarily saying this is no. Nope. Yeah, yeah, true. And that's what's awesome about the LRC digitizers. I mean, oh no kidding. It's like, Thank yep. You. Yes. Yeah. That stuff is amazing. And but you know, um, yeah, we need to get. Does anyone still have pontoon boats out there? Uh, anyone, there I think there? there's a couple over. There's a couple floating around mm-hmm. on the East Coast, so we can but chat that one later. Jim Scheidel asks a question that takes us near the end, and then. I want to circle back uh, before we do our one uh, before we do our one cool thing and talk about paying the crew because I owe a crew a piece of payment here. But let me ask Jim's question: As a filmmaker, is there one project each of you have done that you're particularly proud of and feel you really nailed it, where we can see those works and where we can see those works? Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know that's. I never feel like I nailed it. You know, I really, I don't know. I, I always, there's always something to tweak and I rarely go back and look at stuff much, but you know, we've had a lot of good uh, comments from that civil war, 1864 VR experience. There's some stuff definitely that's uh, a little wacky in there um, with some actors who don't, there's a couple actors who have, you know, first time with a musket kind of shots, but not a lot, but you know, it's not bad. It's a good, I think, put watch it with your headphones on. So, Civil War VR 1864, it's interesting. So, uh, something worth checking out, but I don't know. I'm, I'm always focused on the next project, not the last project. Yeah. <clears throat> Brian, anything you want to share here? Well, you know, the sort of perfectionist nature in me, it's like it's hard to just put something down. And what did I joke with you guys before? It's like, you know, you. What did Martin Scorsese say? He's not ever done with the film. He just has to walk away from it. And, yep. you know, but I would say Owl Creek. And, and when I say that, um, you know, the aversion, the version that we premiered, the version that won a Cine Golden Eagle and a couple other ones, it's not. And to, really to ask where you can go and see it, um, the version that without getting too much into it, 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 the project sort of fell apart and I lost control of it and was re-edited. And it's an embarrassing it's an embarrassing moment and, and story, but that is something that I'm really proud of, uh, that narrative. And I, I would also say, too, you know, some of the documentary we, are, we did for the Antietam battlefield, you know, I mean, some of those scenes, I mean, I don't want to get into, like, the editing of it or anything like that. Or, And, you know, we worked so hard at building a, a wardrobe with, with Charlie Child's cloth and mm-hmm. and just... I don't know how many you know, bu- I don't know how many buttonholes I personally sewed on that. There was know, one day I was heading out east with Brad, and I'm like, "Do you want me to drive?" He said, "No, you know how to sew buttonholes. I can drive." Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, my fingers were numb at doing so many buttonholes, and again, it's like, well, hand done buttonhole. It's because I knew that Brad would want some close ups, and it's like, you know, yep. damn it, I'm sorry. It's like if it's going to be a Richmond Depot jacket, it needs that. You know, it's like. Here it is in Echoes of Glory. Here it is in a photograph in a museum. It's like that. It has to. It has to be that way. And I think. I think for me, some of those I, I was very. i was just very proud of. And uh, you know, I learned a lot from that. And, and Shane, you probably yep. know. Well, Will, you know this too. It's and Will, you see me. It's like, you know, the people that have the best impressions according to our guidelines that that Les Jensen, you know, helped us formulate. Are the closest to the camera, and then the ones further away. It, it, and I had to have painful conversations with people. And you know, Will, there yep. are people that want to. Oh yeah. Kick my kick my ass on set because I never put them in front of the camera. It's like, 
you know, let me spend some time with all my research files with you. But yep. um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of those two things. Well, I tell you, I'm, I can't show yet because we've got a handful of shots to do for it yet. But I'm really happy with the recent cut of Whitney's Metal because not only do we tell a story about somebody making a choice to care for and rearm his men, but we're able in small ways in this story to look at the experience that this regiment has had in the last week with little material culture tweaks. And we're able to find some real true stories about this regiment and the challenges they've been through, um, not just that day in the battle at Chickamauga, but leading up to it. And we're able to work some of those things in, not just in our leading actor, but in fellas who have one line. Sometimes that one line is bringing up a problem that this regiment's been dealing with for seven days. And so I'm really pleased with the way the narrative is coming together there, and I can't wait to show that. Um, if we get lucky on health and safety, we'll be able to shoot the rest of it at the end of August, and it'll go into sound post. That's so, great. Um, I mentioned well, that I need to do one thing as far as paying the crew. You boys have both done a great job raising money to pay your crews. <laughs> I've self-funded both Hold My Horse and um, and Whitney's Metal. And the one thing that happened at the beginning of both of those, especially Hold My Horse, the everybody expected me as the producer, say, let's go, let's go, let's get shooting, let's get <laughs> shooting. The first thing that I did is I brought everybody, the the camera crew mostly came from Chicago Fire and Chicago PD, the shows that I'm not that I've been on for the past five years and are my good friends in the motion picture world. And the living historians are all buddies for years. And I pulled everybody together and I said, look, folks. Thank you for being here. This doesn't happen without you guys. And then I said, I said, look, with the story about Richardson, I said, I refuse to make a penny on your backs. I'd like to make the budget of the film back, but we're going to split any profits two ways. And that's going to be half of it's going to go where Richardson entered Civil War service at historic Fort Wayne in Detroit. And half of it's going out to the Safe Historic Antietam Foundation where Richardson <clears throat> left service when he was mortally wounded. And since we've started selling that film, copies of that film, 30% of it's already doing that. As we retire the budget completely, 100% is going to be split between those because, you know, like you say, these are our friends, this is our community, and right. until I can pay them, it doesn't make sense to make any money on them. Yeah, and will that? I mean, th there are times when people can come together and and they all do it for a cause. I just think it's it's uh, not taking advantage of those situations. And um, yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, uh, the novelty of being in a film for reenactors is worn off, and it and should have. It well. should. It absolutely. It's a job. It's hard good. work. Yeah, it is. It's real hard work, and uh, that's why I like to direct and shoot with all my stuff on. I always, yeah. Heck, I know how hot they are. And, I don't know. I just do. So I Heck, can jump I, out there and load a dead body if I need to. You know? I remember, exactly. I remember, <laughs> shoot, I remember shooting uh, a video mm -hmm. for Media Magic, and we were shooting the 130th anniversary. I think this was right before Video Post got into the game, Shane. We were helping Sorry. Brad Graham for the 130th of the Wilderness, and Brian and I are sleeping in a wall tent that they're selling pre-copies out of in, in Sutler's Row. It's 5 in the morning, and suddenly we hear boom, 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 boom. The morning tactical had started. Brian and I rolled over, looked at each other, jumped up, put Brogans on, grabbed a camera, and chased out as a camera team. <laughs> and that's yeah. that's that's the first event I think Nick Sakella was selling knapsacks. Oh, I, wow. I, yeah, for, for like $100 or something like that. My goodness, can we go back then and take our $100 today's money back to then and pick up and time portal ourselves some reproduction knapsacks back? <laughs> I was reenacting, and I took a massive hit and almost broke my neck in that film. I'm in that film. I'm like way back. I, mean, uh, I, was I think, I, I, I know that. Was, that I know that, uh, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> Well, for those of you who've hung for those of you who've hung on with us, really appreciate you letting us stroll down memory lane and talk about things that are important from cultural aspects to storytelling. We're going to turn to something here, and that's something we do in every Civil War Digital Digest and uh, live stream, and that is one cool thing. We're asking everybody on screen here to share one cool thing from their life with you, something going on. So, Brian, what's what's good in your what's the one cool thing you want to share here? Okay, um, let me see here. I live in a house, 1858. I've been restoring it for 
25, 26 years. Um, we got the dining room done. You can see behind me, we got the period wallpaper. So we're, we're moving on to our stairwell, our front, front stairwell. And my wife, Jody had found some reproduction end run wallpaper of ashlar block that you would see oftentimes in, in hallways and entryways. It's the exact wallpaper that's in the Noah Webster house in Greenfield village. So we're going to be, we're, we have a working with a plaster who's is doing plaster repair work. I've restored all the wood. We're going to put that wallpaper up. I'm going to get the exact color matches. So, you know, we found the great sort of, uh, gas lamp uh, that's going to be hanging from the center. So we're geeking out about that. Not We don't live Civil War life, but we just, uh, you know, we just like restoring uh, and hey, old hey, Sh- hey, Shane, I just found a new set. What's that? <laughs> I just found a new set. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you need to go over there, yeah. Especially right now. I've been looking for a lot of houses like that. We're coming. We're coming to your place. Absolutely. Well, I was thinking we should do a consortium. Everybody on this, the three of us, we need to figure out a project. And- I yeah. would, I would yeah. love to. I would love to. So, Shane, before we get into the weeds on pre-production on a the untitled Shane, Will, and Brian project, <laughs> uh, yeah, what's yeah. your one cool thing? You know, <clears throat> I just got these ca- these caps from Greg Starbuck for a documentary we're doing, and. I mean, there's just something about Greg's caps that just yeah. made me really happy. So they're just so cool. And, Let's uh, see inside, yeah. Shane. Show us the, the inside. Are, the insides are kind of just for the... Mm. Just they're for, unlined. Uh, just, yeah, yeah, unlined. So nothing's lined. But, uh, hey, yeah. Shane, hold that one up again. Oh, beautiful. Hey, Shane, that one? Uh, well, guess what I showed as my one cool thing about four live streams ago. What? That... That one. <laughs> you this one. Don't have that one. Now you're showing off. I am. Matter matter of fact, matter of fact, so. matter of fact Shane, you look like a kid on Christmas morning. You look like a kid on Christmas morning, man. You got this glow. You got the high pro glow, man. Wide awake stuff that'll soon be available for all the wide awake events that we need to do. Yeah. Right? So and Will has got some stuff that's interesting as well. So. Yeah, and and Huck Green just called you a tease, man. I know. I am. I'm so, to yes, he is. So, well, I'll say my one cool thing is I continue to use skills out of the 19th century to provide for my family right now. Uh, we got to head up again today to the farm that I grew up on, and my dad's graced me a whole bunch of garden space because he's not using it. And I harvested lettuce, carrots, cucumbers, and beets. And the beets got set aside for pickling, but salad this evening with dinner was stuff that we grew in our all heirloom variety. So pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Sounds good. So, and uh, Sean Kelly, Send who's... my a, FedEx number. We can do that. Uh, Sean Kelly, who's a longtime friend of mine here, who, Brian, uh, who Brian's interfaced with, I think, on some of the uh, Innovation Nation stuff. He says, hey, don't forget Detroit Local Boy Get a Grip Motion Picture Lighting Services is available for any of your filming needs. So I've worked with Sean as a dollar grip. I've worked with him as a, calf, a gaffer. What a great fella, great historian, and always has a dog around somewhere. So that never hurts my feelings any. Cool. Well, gents, before we close, any last thoughts or comments either you want to share? I can't think of any. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks for tuning in. And, you know, I, there, there are stories that we could probably go on and on, but, uh, um, you know, it, it's like you said, Shane, it takes a team and uh, there's yeah. been some great people and great friendships that have been made over the years. And I think if we all keep striving for that goal, you know, uh, of telling stories of the past, we can keep history alive. I think so. Right? Yeah, and fun. relevant, you know? Yeah. Well, I think Brian gets the last word there because I'm not going to do much better than that. Other than to say, nope. folks, thank you very much, all those of you who've tuned in and spent time with us. Shane, Brian, thanks for giving your evening to help tell some stories here. Uh, for Civil War Digital Digest, I'm going to sign off uh, for the evening, ask our hosts or our guests to hang with me just a second. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thank you.